Hi, I'm Mike Chapman from America by Design on CBS, and you're listening to US Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Being a woman architect in the white male-dominated 20th century was tough. You were paid less, worked harder, and rarely got any credit. But if you were an African-American architect in white male-dominated 20th century, it was nearly impossible. For example, by 1950, there were only two black architects registered in North Carolina. Neither of them were women. By 1980, the number was only 65 out of 1,909. Even by 1993, black architects made up only 7.5% of all architects nationally. The National Trust for Historic Preservation, supported by the Getty Foundation in Los Angeles, is working to share and elevate the achievements of African-American architects, both men and women. And today we'll hear from the director of that program, Brent Leggs. We'll also talk with Charles McAfee, considered by many to be the greatest living African-American architect. Later on, we'll chat with jazz vocalist Jamie Paul. And now here's your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. Earlier this year, I was honored to speak at Century Two, a performing arts center in Wichita, Kansas. Under threat for years, Century Two was saved from demolition by organizer Celeste Reset, who rallied Wichita to save this iconic structure designed by Frank Lloyd Wright student John Hickman. The day before the talk, I got to meet renowned architect Charles McAfee in a lively breakfast organized by Celeste. I was amazed at the breadth of his work and how he was so far ahead of his time and the industry with modular prefab design and manufacturing. After that meeting, Charles and I created an online archive of his houses, which you can find at usmodernist.org slash McAfee. That's M-C-A-F-E-E. There are many more stories of African-American architects out there, and we'll talk next with Brent Leggs, who is working to find them. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by June Goldfinger and Jeff Taylor, sponsors of Circle, Square, Triangle, a traveling exhibition on the architecture of Myron Goldfinger, and by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Malibu, Toronto, Los Angeles, and Palm Springs. Brent Leggs is a vice president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. A graduate of Tillman High School in Paducah, Kentucky. Go Blue Tornado! And with an undergraduate degree and MBA from the University of Kentucky. Go Wildcats! He was the first black graduate of that school's master's program in historic preservation. He is the author of the seminal 2012 book, Preserving African American Historic Places, and a contributor to the 2022 book, Preservation and Social Inclusion. He's now focusing on the work of black modernist architects, and he's a man the New Yorker described as someone who spends time thinking in centuries. Welcome, Brent. Thank you. Hey, Brent, so tell me about this centuries thing. Like, how many hundred years are you thinking ahead? Well, I had the good fortune of spending time with New Yorker journalist Casey Sepp for that feature profile in February of 2020. And during our conversations, I shared that the work of historic preservation happens long term. And to be able to do this work successfully, you have to have patience and perseverance and a dogged commitment to helping communities realize a vision, which is to harness the power of place to build a true national identity that reflects America's diversity. So kind of long-winded way of saying, I think in centuries, because the work that we do means that we must preserve place in perpetuity. So we've got to think not only decades ahead, but centuries ahead. You can't be impatient. No, you can't be impatient. 
you have to have a clear vision. You have to build community support around a project. And I think what's exciting is a lot of the public understands preservation through the lens of the way that our grandparents preserve places, but the velvet ropes and the traditional house museum. But historic preservation today is so much more provocative and creative. And I actually see the work of preserving place and in particular preserving overlooked contributions in American history as an act of service, as a radical act of love, and as a way of helping our nation understand its own history. And that's so important because we just don't want to remember history, do we, as a nation? We're just not into that so much. (laughs) Well, we can be selective sometimes. we really can. In the history of architecture by black architects, the profession really came into its own as a field around the 1880s or so. So when did the first black architects emerge on the scene? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you understand the role of historically black colleges and universities that have been established for more than 150 years, they were the breeding ground for the evolution of black American architecture and design, and mainly starting with the trades professions that have evolved again into a more formal field of practice. Oftentimes, I look at the work of Robert Taylor, who Mm -hmm. is America's first licensed professional Black architect and graduate of MIT. And one of the first historic houses that I think is emblematic of the potential of Black architects and how they can use their creative expression to create physical forms in the form of a residence is Booker T. Washington's The Oaks. And I don't know if you've ever been to the campus of Tuskegee University and ever walked the grounds of his grand, elegant, historic residence that overlooks that historic landscape and historic campus. It was one of the most modern houses during its time, one of the first houses wired with electricity. And so I often think through what did it mean for a Black family to work with a professional Black architect to design and inform a place that would be a safe haven for a personal refuge and a place for him to continue to to be the social critic and thought leader that he was. So I would say this is kind of a long-winded way of, of saying Robert Taylor has inspired generations of Black architects. When did he live? That is a good question. Hang on there. Hang on. I am pulling up our files on Robert Taylor. Oh. Because he's connected to North Carolina. So he is. So not only the Oaks and the home of Booker T. Washington, one of his finest examples of residential architecture and the Queen Anne style, but he also was one of the original designers for what we know as historic Rosenwald schools. All right. You You studied those quite a bit, didn't you? I did. And just for context, Booker T. Washington envisioned a massive school building program and partnered with Julius Rosenwald, who at the time was the second president of Sears and Roebuck. And together they would help to fund the construction of over 5,000 school buildings in 15 southern states. And the original school plans were designed by Robert Taylor. So here's a little bit about Robert Taylor. Born in 1868, died in 1942, the first professionally trained black architect in the United States. He was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, on 8th Street, which is no longer there. And he was the first black architecture student at MIT, graduating in 1892. He worked for a couple of firms and then designed buildings, as Brent said, on Tuskegee University's campus, including the chapel and the Oaks. And then in North Carolina... Taylor designed the Carnegie Library in 1906 on Livingstone's College campus in Salisbury. He retired and returned to Wilmington. He was appointed by the governor of the state to be on what is now Fayetteville State University, and he died while attending services in the Tuskegee Chapel. His son became an architect in Chicago, and his granddaughter is Valerie Jarrett, who became a senior advisor to Obama. Oh, yeah. What do you know? Wow. Yeah. That's quite a pedigree. It is. If you're interested in learning more, I'd encourage you to get the book, A Better Life, 
for their children by photographer Andrew Feiler. The foreword was written by the late Congressman John Lewis, who attended Rosenwald schools. Mm. And it's a beautiful pictorial and his histography about that school building's impact and, and program. So it's both visual, but also a, a great educational resource. So what are Rosenwald schools or what were they? They were the most advanced school plans and facilities for Black children during the period of segregation. They stand as a physical manifestation of a social movement in response to a crisis in Black education. The concept was born in the brilliant mind of Booker T. Washington, and it was an innovative philanthropic strategy that included four benefactors one, the local Black community that donated land and, and building materials and often constructed the school buildings. It was the school boards, the local school boards, the Rosenwald Fund, and others that would join their resources to be able to support the development and construction of these school buildings. The impact of Rosenwald schools can never be understated. And based on an economic study, one in four African-American children attended Rosenwald schools in the early and mid 20th century. Were these public schools or did they get absorbed by the local county school board? How did that work? Yeah, so they were public schools and each community had the freedom to use the Rosenwald school building plans or to follow the local school building plans. And in my home state of Kentucky, I spent a while in grad school, a year and a half, documenting the school buildings in my home state. And that's when I learned that my mom and dad attended Rosenwald schools. And so the work became personal to me. But I also had the good fortune of touring several school buildings and meeting local preservationists. And that's when the light bulb went off because I saw alumni school members just local concerned citizens advocating for the preservation of, of this history, and oftentimes with limited resources or technical knowledge. And it was clear that an up-and-coming professional like myself had a lot of opportunity to guide preservation projects and, and really support communities in realizing their vision for the preservation of American history. Now, your book, Preserving African-American Historic Places, is like the seminal text on this now. I mean, everybody refers to it in this whole segment. Did you know that? I have heard good things about it. <laughs> Apparently yeah. everybody else has too. Yeah, they sure have. <laughs> well, that makes me really happy to hear because, you know, it took about two years to conduct the research and to write. And with intention, wanted to lay out a compelling case statement or at least to define through my lens at that time, the, the big why, like why should we preserve place and, and really highlighting the quiet power of historic preservation. And then wanted to have the middle section really around the tools and best practices for preserving place. And then the ending section is six case studies that highlights the different ways that communities preserve historic places. So I'm glad to know that it is a valuable resource mm -hmm. that still has a lot of impact. Well, at least a few people who have read it are at the Getty Center in California because they have gone all in in supporting your project. How did that come about? So the Getty had a, a former program that was called Keeping It Modern. And for seven years, they advocated and worked with property owners, mainly internationally, to help preserve modernist sites. And they were keenly aware of the absence of diversity, and in particular, the absence of Black architectural legacies within their portfolio of 70 plus places. And so they had a conversation with their advisor, Dr. Mabel Wilson, who is mm -hmm. a scholar and professor at Columbia University, and Mabel advised that they reach out to me for a technical consultation. And after a couple of conversations, we decided that we should collaborate. They invested $3.1 million. We launched Conserving Black Modernism a year and a half ago with a goal of investing $150,000 per project in 16 projects that uplifts the overlooked contribution of Black American architects in the modernist style. So tell us about some of these projects that you identified. 
We awarded eight grantees last year. What was exciting is we had a diverse pool of projects and archetypes from historic buildings on the campus of HBCU at Morgan State University in Baltimore Mm -hmm. to four historic Black churches, all the way to civic buildings. So some include the Carson City Hall building in California, and it is this sublime, beautiful piece of architecture that really is fundamental to that community's civic identity. Who designed that one? Architect Robert Kennard. Oh, sure. Yeah, he's pretty well known. He's really doing quite well now with his reputation years later. Years later. He has the oldest Black-owned architecture firm that still managed today as a legacy business by his daughter, Gail Kennard. Mm -hmm. And it was a diverse design team, and it was influenced by Spanish and and Japanese design. Wow. I can't quite picture that. I'll need to look it up. It's a really beautiful building, and I think the exterior instantly articulates modernism because of the lines and the kind of curvature of the form but also in the materials that were selected. But the interior design features really represents modernism. It's a beautiful building. And what inspired us to select this building as a grantee is not many members of the public will walk past a city hall building and understand that a Black American architect designed it. That's right. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And his firm is still running, still in operation, correct? It is. It is still in operation. And and we had a convening at the Getty Foundation a month and a half ago, and we had a, a session with the descendants of some of the architects. So Cheryl McAfee, mm-hmm. Gail Kennard, and, and others were there. And Gail shared that she anticipates that the firm is in its 11th hour and is likely to close its doors in the near future, which was really disheartening to hear. But it reaffirms why historic preservation is even more important to keep this kind of civic memory alive and to ensure that we never forget the design contribution of American architects like Robert Kennard. I know so many of the architecture firms just kind of vanish after a while. I mean, very few of them do make it to the second generation at all, or even to subsequent partners. And all that stuff ends up in a storage unit somewhere or thrown away, even worse. Our organization is constantly working with people to try to rescue some of this stuff and, and, you know, at least try to get it into safe hands. Because once it's gone, it's really gone. I agree. And I appreciated that you used the word rescue because we're often considering our activities as rescue work. And one example is the What's Happening Cultural Center in Los Angeles. And I don't know if you all have seen this building, but it was designed by two African-American architects, Robert Kennard and Arthur Silvers. And it sits as a centerpiece of Black arts and culture within the historic neighborhood of Watts. And the building has been vacant for years. And it was originally constructed for the Mufundi Institute. So it was a a Hmm. social justice space and an organizing space that has evolved into an arts and culture center. And there's so much potential for the reuse of that historic building that will continue to anchor a Black cultural and design legacy in L.A. Now, when the Getty was doing Keeping It Modern, I was familiar with that program. and, And they would do things like they worked with the Eames House, for instance, And they did strategic planning for the Eames House and helped provide some consultants for shoring up things. But the responsibility really for the renovation and upkeep part was up for the Eames Foundation to raise the funds. Does your program work the same way or is there a little difference? No, it's a similar format and and structure. So we provide grants of $150,000 and we've got two funding categories. One is project planning only or project planning with limited capital support. And the majority of the projects are funding conservation management plans, historic structure reports, conditions assessments that help inform how the property owners will renovate the building over time. And one of the motivating factors 
is to expand interpretation for public education mm -hmm. so that we can present to the public the history of, of Black architects in the 20th century. And then, of course, the limited capital is pretty straightforward. A lot of these buildings have water infiltration issues and other issues and need short-term stabilization to ensure that the building envelope and, and the actual resources are retained and, and preserved. Are these buildings still drawing tourists? I mean, I know with a lot of buildings, there's kind of a small underground movement of people who love these things and go to a city and seek them out and are taking photos in front of them, that kind of thing. I assume that's occurring with these buildings as well, because they do have a, a good reputation and they're very symbolic. Yeah, there are a lot of curious and engaged citizens that love and appreciate modernism and just appreciate design. And because of the increased visibility through our program and our partnership with Getty, we are hearing from folks that are actually going out and photographing and visiting places. What's also unique is none of the eight inaugural grantees are museums. Mm. These are all active and viable historic places like a city hall building or a swimming pool in Wichita, Kansas, yes. or an academic building on the campus of Morgan State, or four active historic churches. So they're living buildings still? They are. They are living buildings that are imbued with beauty, culture, and hopefully can stimulate enough curiosity that the public wants to learn more about Black architects, modernism, and some of the nuances that makes conserving Black modernism distinctive. This is really a great effort, Brent. People who want to contribute to this, is there a way they can donate to this and add to what the Getty is doing? Yeah, we would love that. Because our goal is to be able to help invest in 40 modernist sites designed by Black architects over the next several years. And if the public can help us leverage and match Getty's 3.1 million, that would be fantastic. And they can go to savingplaces.org. They can browse the Action Fund's website and learn more about our conservative Black modernism and can make a donation online. That's really cool. Brent, thank you for sharing time with us. Of course. Thank you for having me on. That was George's conversation with Brent Legs. Architect Charles McAfee grew up in Kansas. After serving in the Korean War, Charles studied architecture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and was one of the first black architecture graduates in 1958. Five years later, Charles started his own firm in Wichita, focusing on affordable housing, including modular building. At one point, he opened a modular manufacturing plant that trained and employed people in the Wichita community. That firm expanded to other cities, opening offices in Dallas and Atlanta. McAfee designed a broad range of other projects, including the facilities for the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, McAdams Park in Wichita, and the McKnight Art Center and Ulrich Museum at Wichita State University. He was president of the National Organization of Minority Architects, or NOMA, and won the National 1999 AIA Whitney M. Young Jr. Award. Considered to be the greatest living African-American architect, he continues to mentor young black architects. His daughters, Cheryl Mitchell and Charles McAfee Duncan, also became architects and lead his company today. George caught up with Mr. McAfee recently via Zoom. Charles, when you were coming along, the most famous black architect in America was Paul Williams in California. Did you ever meet him? He was my hero. When I was uh, between semesters at the University of Nebraska, I thought I wanted to go to California to work. So I made connections with three firms in Los Angeles. One was Paul Williams, one was Richard Neutra, and the third was Welton Beckett. Good picks. And I got interviews from all three of them. And in fact, Neutra took me and a couple of other students on a ride through some of his Hollywood projects that he had designed. And I thoroughly enjoyed that afternoon with Richard Neutra. Wow. Years later, I was in a magazine published by the United States for African-American professionals in music and arts and architecture. And Paul Williams 
was there representing architecture. On the last two pages, it said, now come the young Turks. <laughs> and here I stood in front of this house that I had done, the very first job I ever had at 1436 North Madison here in Wichita. That's the Eubanks house, right? The Eubanks house. It says, here come the young Turks. And I'm standing there looking mean. <laughs> I called Paul and I said, have you seen this book? He said, no. I said, well, have somebody in your office call AID and get this because it's a great coverage of you. And then when I would fly back out to Los Angeles for anything, he would always invite me by his house. We'd get in his big car and we'd go to see a professional baseball game. We had a marvelous relationship after that. He said, why didn't you come work for me in the first place? I said, to be real honest with you, I didn't think I was good enough. He said to me, you didn't give me any credit for me having enough sense to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> During that time, that would have been what, the late 50s, early 60s? Early 60s. According to Wikipedia, which of course knows everything, there were about 20,000 architects in the United States. And they're saying that 0.05% were black, which if I do the math, that's like 12 people. Well, let me tell you something. I'm in Wichita, Kansas. The closest black architectural firm to me was in Denver, Colorado. The next closest was in Houston, Texas. And that was John Chase. Right, sure. Who graduated from Hampton and then was the first African-American to get a master's degree or any architecture degree from University of Texas. Burt Bruton in Denver was in college at Howard University was in the same graduating class with my wife. And Bert is a fraternity brother of mine, so we knew each other from almost day one. Now, was your wife in architecture school too or another program? No, she was in music. She was she in music. She majored in opera. In opera? Wow. She was a Mary Anderson scholar. Did you get to perform in opera? No, she never did. I got drafted in the middle of my third semester. I was up in Nebraska. I had to go get my physical during Christmas, and in the middle of the semester, March the 6th, I had to appear in the Army, and they flunked me on 18 hours. I said, why don't you drop me? I, I mean, I can't finish the class. Nope. <laughs> but I always seemed to land on my feet, I think. I went all the way through basic training. The uh, Korean War was on. The week we got out of basic training, the war ended, and they shipped me to Europe. Now, I'd had all of my history lessons, done all my European sketches. Once I got there, I made the European All-Star basketball team. So I traveled Paris, Rome, Berlin, London, and I don't know how many, Stuttgart, I don't know how many other places. But I saw many of the famous buildings that I had once studied historically. But when I got back, my wife was already out of Howard and finished her master's in opera at, at Indiana. We got married and she came to Lincoln. And then when I finally graduated a year later, we came home. We we're trying to make up our minds what we were going to do, whether or not I was going to California or another black architect from Wichita who had graduated in out of World War II. Wait a second. There was another one? <laughs> there was one more. <laughs> his, his name was John Henderson. All right. And he, he was working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Denver. His mother and my mother sang in the same church choir. And he heard I was in town when he came. So he walked around the corner. And we're sitting there on the porch. And he says, I knew you couldn't get a job here because I tried when I got out. And nobody would. Have. Can you imagine a guy who was in World War II and you wouldn't hire him because he was black, but nobody hired him. I didn't like anybody to tell me what I couldn't do. So Monday morning, I went out. This one firm that I thought was the best firm in Wichita at the time, he said, we just had to lay two or three people off because we don't have any more work right now. But there's another firm that I understand might have some work and may need some people. I said, okay, thank you. So I went by to see this guy. So I showed the guy my stuff. The guy said, stuff is really good. This is better than what I've seen from most people graduating. So I went to work for these guys. We were doing a middle school. Got a new superintendent, and he stopped everything. 
So there were three owners and three workers, and they laid all three of the workers off. So, but that afternoon, I had another job already offered to me by another firm. There were only six of us there. Well, I ended up doing at least half of the design on design projects. But the members were members of country clubs here in Wichita. So if they were going to meet with an owner, even if I was designing their project, they would meet at the country club. But I couldn't go because no blacks were allowed at the country club. So I stood up with that about as long as I could take it. I went over on a Wednesday and I said, Friday's my last day. He said, what? What are you getting ready to do? I said, I'm not at liberty to say. So I left. I went home. I'm trying to make up my mind. I'm walking around my neighborhood. I went down and talked to my daddy. He said, why are you not happy? I said, daddy, I want to put my name on the door somewhere. He said, let's do it. So we found a place. And while I found that place, we were remodeling it. My dad and I, second floor of a building. I had this one job. It was a 1,200-square-foot house, set on a 50-foot wide lot, two-car garage. That was the RAU Bank's residence. I drew all night long. I never changed anything and got it built and submitted for an award, which I didn't know anything about. A couple of weeks later, I get this letter. It said, you won a first honor award for design on housing from the Housing and Home Finance Agency, later to become HUD. Oh, for HUD. Okay. Yeah, sure. Then a couple of days before, I called the office and I said, what am I supposed to do? I haven't received any further information. The woman apologized and was very sorry. I said, well, you're flying in when? I said, well, tomorrow night. My wife and I will be there tomorrow night. So, well, after you have breakfast, come down the street. Our temporary officers are right down the street from the hotel. And walked in the door. The receptionist was sitting there. She looked up at me and my wife. She said, are you Mr. McAfee? And I said, yeah, the woman jumped up and ran out of the room. Well, what the hell's wrong? So she comes back out. She's got another woman by the hand. And one of them says, Dr. Weaver's going to be so proud. Well, then I knew what it was. Dr. Weaver became the first African-American ever elected or appointed to a president's cabinet. And so she said, what you need to do now is go back. One of the other award winners is in getting pictures taken when he comes out, you go in and get your pictures taken. So a few minutes later, the door opened. This guy walked out and he looked at me and he says, are you one of the award winners? And I said, yes. He said, how old are you? I said, 29. He said, uh, I remember those days. I started to ask him if he had to borrow the money from his daddy to come get the <laughs> award, but I didn't. It was I am pay. Wow. Charles McAfee and I am Pay? What? Pay had designed apartments at Kipps Bay in New York. I've been in those. They're beautiful. I go in and we're talking, and the guy starts telling me who the other five awardees are. Skidmore's in Maryland had done a retirement community in Southern California, but Mies Van Der Rohe had gotten the Twin Towers on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. Marvelous examples. Beautiful. And so... I'm floating on a cloud. You can believe that. So the next day, they're showing the various projects. And when it gets up on the screen, it says, the R.A. Eubanks residence, Wichita, Kansas, architect Charles McAfee. You can hear 2,000 people say, who? Where? Because <laughs> nobody knew my name, didn't know anything about me. Right after that, I got architectural record, PA, everybody. All the magazines were showing me and my house. I had won an AI award for the state of Kansas. Now I won a national award. And so I got a whole lot of publicity all over every place. Now, is that house still in existence? Is it still doing okay? It's still doing okay, and it's still in, in existence. Oh, that's wonderful. I know so many of you know the houses from that era have been torn down. Right. Do the people that own it now realize why it's an important house? Oh, yes. The Eubanks family, the daughter, ended up a national TV reporter, and they moved to Cincinnati to take care of their grandson. But the person who bought it from them just absolutely loved the house and just treated it extremely well. He died about two years ago. Now his niece lives in the house, and she just takes care of it like it's her baby. 
you're a fellow in the AIA, and both your daughters are architects and fellows right. in the AIA, making you the most unique family in architecture. We're the only one, only family with that credential. Yeah. Youngest daughter graduated from Texas, master's, undergraduate in Nebraska, like I did. The reason she went to Texas was because oldest daughter graduated in Kansas State. She was working here. I had an office then in Kansas City, and I had just opened an office in Atlanta about a year or so earlier. I went down to Atlanta one day, and we put together a joint venture, and we went after the Olympics. I came back home, and I walked in the door, and I said, baby, we got the Olympics in Atlanta. She said, Daddy, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that, Charles. What structures did you do for the Atlanta Olympics in 96? We were the chief architect for all 32 ventures. Every last one of them that came up, we had exactly four years from the time Atlanta was named to the games were supposed to begin. So we had to very quickly hire consulting firms to design Olympic Stadium, all the other 31 venues. That's a fast track still. Oh, it was crazy. The day that we were named, the whole team at that point was about 22 or three people. We were all sitting around the table and Billy Payne came in. He was the one who came in and talked to Mayor Andrew Young at the time. And he turned and was looking out the window. He said, well, Mr. Mayor, what do you think? He said, yeah, I think we ought to do it. I was counting votes. Well, he had been ambassador to the United Nations. That year, it was supposed to be the 100th anniversary in Athens. So we won it from Athens. It was 1996. When was Athens? Four years later. In 2000. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about the National Association of Minority Architects, right. which you were involved in you know, from the very early days. Not a lot of people know about that organization. It has grown significantly over the decades and has now helped elect a female African-American as its president several times, in including your daughter, I believe. Right. And also the head of the National AIA. The times have really changed from the days of old white guys. Well, when we formed the organization, there were only 10 or 11 of us that were the founders of NOMA. We were spread all over the country. We all struggled to get with each other and share knowledge and sometimes even partner on various projects all over every place. It was a hard time for me to get everybody. I'd go to Detroit, I'd go to Houston, I'd go to Washington. And finally, I think they all felt horrible. I said, why don't we meet in Kansas City? So they met in Kansas City. So I said, okay, guys, there's one place I want to take all of you. It's the best barbecue in the country. And John Chase said, oh, no, uh -uh. your barbecue can't compare with Texas. I said, come on, we're going to a place called Gates. Holly Gates and I have very close friends. I'm going to take you. John Chase was eating out of everybody's plate. I've never tasted barbecue this good. I said, I told you that. Is that in Wichita? <laughs> no, that was in Kansas City. In and Kansas it's still City. there. Still there. Okay. Gates barbecue is still all over the place. One time, we were not getting any work from federal agencies. So three of us, Bob Wilson from Connecticut, and me, and another guy from Fort Worth, all had long black leather coats on and top hats. We just busted in a federal office and said, listen, we want some work. <laughs> That's the way it had to happen. Charles, as you look at your career, what are some of the favorite buildings that you designed? Starting with the Eubanks house, it's one of the absolute favorite things I did. Down 13th Street, if you start at the farthest east on 13th Street, I did a modular system because a guy by the name of George Romney, who became the Secretary of Housing, didn't know a damn thing about housing, but he came from automobile, I think American Motors. And he made a statement at a speech one day, and he said, what we need to do to get a, enough housing done we need to build housing like we build cars in a factory. And it hit me, and I said, that makes sense. You established McAfee Manufacturing to do that. I had about $50,000 that I could kind of mess with. So I designed these modules. When I did the Eubanks house, people would come by and say, 
where's the waste? I said, there is no waste. Everything was in a five-foot module. So the wood beams were spaced on five-foot modules. The wood deck was 10-foot, and the vertical siding was exactly eight-foot tall. And so that was the discipline. But when I opened the factory, I didn't know nothing about borrowing any money. So some guys came to me and wanted to invest with me. Okay. We turned out this first house. I was vice president of Wichita Chamber at the time. So the chamber put on a show. And over a weekend, there were 5,000 people went through this house. It won an AIA award for design, a National HUD award at that point. And so all of a sudden, everybody decided they were going to put more money in the deal and cut me out of it. <laughs> so I went to a board meeting, and they had a the motion on the floor increase their stock and leave mine where it was, which was almost now nothing. I say, excuse me, my agreement was that no matter what happens, the control of my interest will never be less than a third. And the guy who was trying to run the motion looked at the lawyer and the lawyer says, he's right. The guy had a nervous breakdown and voted to shut the factory down, and they did. I had rented Boeing plant number one, It was 95,000 square feet. That's a big plant. I had to lay off over 100 people. But my reputation on this modular system has gone all over every place. Then as I come down 13th Street, there's Jackson Marchwary. The Jackson twins and I grew up together, played bitty baseball, bitty basketball together. They said, why don't you restart the factory? So I did. I ended up with almost 200 people. I took 50 women off of welfare one day. I gave them 100% health care, uniforms to wear. I started them at a $15 an hour wage. And within three months, they could build houses as good as anybody. And so next to Jackson Mortuary, which is a design award, on a piece of ground owned by Jackson Mortuary, we did our new modular housing factory two-story unit called the Brookhaven. Won two design awards for that. And what happened to that plant? We got up to the point where we were turning out a house a day. And our agreement was, as we turned the house out and put them on a site, if we didn't sell them right away, we turned them over to the bank as equity to keep the loan revolving. One day, I got a letter saying that our line of credit had ceased. So I called and I said, what are you talking about? Wouldn't tell us. Well. We had a young woman who we had hired as our financial officer who had been with federal FDIC. She said, the feds are in that bank right now. They're going to end up selling that bank to somebody. But why would they reduce your line of credit just because they were being sold? Because they had no control anymore. The government shut them down. Just shut down the whole bank. This young woman that we had hired said, that's what we used to do. If a bank was in trouble, that's the way we did it. And no one wanted to step up from another bank? No. Nope. To support this incredible organization you built? I told you about a lot of projects for black people. Yeah. My black clients, including me, when I tried to build a little two-bedroom house, we first moved in. I'm a veteran. I went out to the VA. The VA turned me down. So when I tried to build my own house, I had to put up 50% of the cash to get a loan. When I did Jackson Mortuary, I uh, asked Mr. and Mrs. Jackson, do you have your bank loan yet? And they both looked at me and said, don't you know they don't loan us money? I said, what? Now, it hit me. If they don't loan Jackson Mortuary any money, the rest of us are in trouble. The politicians covered them, so they wouldn't be in any trouble. But that changed, right? Well, to a certain extent. They can still find all the reasons in the world why you're not qualified. That's still going on. Let me ask you this, Charles. We've done several shows about public housing, and many times architects will believe that design is the way to create communities. But time and time again, it's because the communities, particularly at the federal level, don't fund infrastructure within public housing. For instance, schools, industry, business religious facilities, things like that. And they also don't provide any money for the maintenance once it's built. 
What did you think was the cause why a number of these public housing projects didn't work? There is a book that I recommend. It's called The Culture of Law. The Culture of Law. And what it does, it goes all the way back prior to World War II. The most segregated community in the United States is now one of the most liberal areas in the United States. It's San Francisco. Okay. But Wichita was right there with it. Why did the San Francisco area become a segregated housing development? There was this huge shipbuilding operation in the San Francisco area. San Jose built two major housing projects. One was designated for white people and the other was designated for black people. Wichita, Kansas had 100,000 people before World War II. When the war broke out, we have Boeing, Beach, Cessna. Everybody's building airplanes. Southern part, closer to Boeing, there are all these one-story fourplexes. None of them have garages, but most of them didn't even have carports or parking places. So what happened was they segregated to the black community. All during the war, black people couldn't live closer to Boeing. White people couldn't live further away. This went on all over the United States. Probably the most famous one that finally got the attention when they started tearing it down was pruitt Igo in St. Louis. In St. Louis, of course. Those things were horrible. I got invited up to Chicago. I was on an AIA panel. And when it was my turn to speak, I said, I just made a tour of the 19 and 21-story public housing units where the stairs and the elevator and the trash chutes are on the outside of the buildings. So in the wintertime, when the cold comes off that lake, the elevators freeze. In the summertime, when you dump the trash from 21 stories down, it hits the ground floor and it falls out of the doors on the ground and you have to walk by the mice and the rats. And in the wintertime, if you're a little boy and you can't walk, four stories or five stories or 20 stories to get up to your bathroom. You go to the bathroom on the stairs and people say, look how terrible they are. I said, we as architects have created architectural genocide. And some guy was in the audience and he heard the speech. And the guy says, um, can I come interview you? He told me why. And I said, yes, he came. Oh, the name of the book is The Color of Law. The color of law. The answer to the question you have is, it is so obvious in this book. I mean, it's incredible. So the guy came to my office, and we were sitting there talking, and I have things on the walls. And there was a print of an exhibit called I Music. It was the color exhibit of Gordon Parks' first abstract color photography. And it was personally signed to Charles from Gordon. And he says, do you know him? I said, well, yeah, I know him very well. Do you think he would give me an interview? I said, well, let's see. I turned around. I had him on speed dial. I caught him at his house. I said, Gordon, there's a guy here. He's interviewing me for a book, and he'd like to interview you. You want him to? I said, yeah, I'll give him my information. The book came out. It's called Black Genius. In this book, there's a whole lot of really smart people, not me. He writes about. Gordon Parks, Duke Ellington, Lena Horne, a lot of people like that, Adam Clayton Powell, just a whole bunch of people. Well, a few years later, he added to the book, added some guy named Barack something or other. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> so he's in a book with Charles McAfee. <laughs> Charles, I, I could talk to you all day, but we, we got to go. Thank you so much for our conversation. I got the pleasure of meeting Charles in Wichita recently, and that was so nice. Thanks for joining me. All right. That was my conversation with Wichita architect Charles McAfee. Jamie Paul moved to Nashville from Southern Illinois to study music and business at Belmont University. Go Bruins! But her journey would largely involve doing marketing and promotion for various musicians on various labels. 
Still, Jamie was also singing behind artists like Barry Manilow and Dolly Parton, and touring as a backup singer for The Judds and Kelly Clarkson. She was the first female vocalist signed to Green Hill Music, and her debut album, At Last, reached number one on the iTunes jazz charts. Her latest album is People. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. This is really great. You've really had, you know, quite a career. You've worked on both sides of music, kind of on the business side and on the performance side, right? Oh, yes, yes. What were your first days in this? Was it in more in business or more singing? Uh, definitely more in business. Okay. So the story is when I graduated from Belmont in 99, I had already had a part-time job at BMI. And BMI is, you know, the PRO as far as uh, royalties and licenses and all that is concerned. Right. But anyway, I was singing and I did one jingle that went to a regional area. So I made a little bit of money off of that. But um, throughout the first early years of graduating, I worked at BMI and then I worked at a magazine after that. And then I went to a label and I spent a good two years at Reunion Records. And I worked in the publicity department, the marketing department, and then I actually was a radio promoter for about eight months. After that, I went pretty much straight into just singing. Yes. And I've been doing that ever since. Ever since. In a former life, I was a radio music director. (laughs) So you probably would have called me if we'd been in the same format. I would have, (laughs) right? I would have called you. Yep. (laughs) That's fantastic. One of the things that I'm struck by in in listening to your music is you just have this sort of rich, is it contralto? Is that the right uh, frame of reference voice? I would say that as far as recording is yeah. concerned, contra alto. Yeah, I generally love to stick to the low range, the low registers of of the song. So, yeah. Yeah. You can just sort of imagine, like, the first thing that came to mind when I saw your picture and then I heard you sing was a little Jessica Rabbit vibe going in there. <laughs> Fantastic. Very sultry. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you. I will take that as a compliment. It thank is. you very much. What's her famous line? I'm just drawn this way. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not right? bad. I'm, I'm just, just drawn, drawn this way. way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this first song was written in 1952 by Alan Brandt and Bob Hames. Mm-hmm. Nat King Cole recorded it first, but Bobby Darin made it his breakout hit in 1959. And it's been covered by Michael Buble, Mel Torme, and most recently, Steve Terrell who we've been trying to get on the show for three years. Yes, Steve, we're talking to you. (laughs) And also the incomparable Sarah Vaughn. Here's Jamie with That's All. I can only give you love that lasts forever And a promise to be near each time you call I'm the only heart I own For you and you alone That's all, that's all I can only give you country walks in springtime And a hand to hold when leaves begin to fall And a love whose burning light
show that have told you they would give you the world for a toy. All I have are these arms to enfold you and a love that time can never destroy. If you're wondering what I'm asking in return, dear, you'll be glad to know that my demands are small. Say it's me that you'll adore for now and evermore. That's all. Wow. Where are you performing this fall? Because I want to come see this live. Oh, thank you so much. Do you have any tour dates lined up? Not necessarily in the North Carolina area. A- anywhere, um, anywhere. We'll fly. Anywhere. We'll, we're international. People listen to yeah. us in South Carolina, too. All over the planet, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, I, I will keep you posted. Okay. We have, uh, We do have a date coming up. Actually, in Statesville, you know, just south of Charlotte, October the 12th. But we're not doing that's all. We have another show that's a James Bond tribute show. Oh, and yeah. And that, yeah, if the, um, so I have an album that's called so, Bonded. So you do your own Shirley and, um, Bassey stuff? Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, to- boy. Totally. Goldfinger and, you know, the, the whole nine. So we have a really fun James Bond show. And that's where we'll be in October, October the 12th. But other than that, I'll just have to keep you posted. So tell me your website. It's jamiepaul.com. So J-A-I-M-E-E-P-A-U-L.com. And that's where you can get on Jamie's mailing list and follow her tour schedule and just generally keep track like I'm going to do. Right. That's right. (laughs) Right, right. So what about this Bond thing? When did you do the Bond album? Uh, back in 2013. So mm-hmm. I can't believe this, but it's been, you know, over 10 years ago now. Yeah, and yeah. Michael Omardian was the producer on that album. And that was just such an amazing experience, not only to be produced by him, but to also just be able to kind of cut loose and have fun on these amazing theme songs. So the label back in 2012, when we were recording it, they said, you know, the 50th anniversary of the Bond film series is coming up. Mm -hmm. We should do an album. And I said, okay, that sounds fantastic. That's great. Let's do it. So we picked out our songs and the album only covers the first 50 years of the series. And of course there are, you know, a couple more movies out since then, but we had a really fun time making this record. And sometimes we'll perform it with a full symphony uh, as well, which is really fun. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Did you get a chance to do a video with this? Because I imagine that would have been awesome. Well, so we have a promo video for the okay. Bond uh, okay. show. It's a fun little promo video. Well, I would love to play a bunch of Bond songs here because they're great. But I wanted to feature this particular <laughs> one. This is from your latest album, People, mm-hmm. written in 1928 by Cole Porter and entered the yeah. public domain earlier this year. It was the very first hit song to proclaim... That sex is fun. What? Surprise, surprise. Huh. And it was recorded by Eartha Kitt, Louis Armstrong, Frank Sinatra, and Shirley MacLaine, Kim Basinger, who I had no idea could really sing, but she's great, Molly Ringwald, <laughs> and there's even a version on Sesame Street. About sex being fun? Well, not <laughs> explicitly, Tom, but it's implied. <laughs> okay. It's very subtle. In fact, um, Bert and Ernie were just announced as gay, so it's very subtle. Okay. Yeah, it applies to everyone. Here's Jamie with Let's Do It. Birds do it, bees do it, even 
an educated please do it let's do it let's fall in love in Spain the best of the sets do it Lithuanians and let's do it let's do it let's fall Siamese twins Some Argentines Without means Do it People say in Boston Even beans Do it Let's do it Let's fall in love song yes you make it sound so fresh though it's you do. wonderful sound well, like you're having fun well thank yeah. you oh we really had a just a ball recording this album and it's pat coyle on the piano danny gottlieb on the drums um jacob jezro playing the bass and then andy reese is playing that uh, amazing guitar yeah so that's very nice just a ball yeah i didn't look at all the songs on the album but is is people on the album people you mean the yeah. Barbara Streisand song? Yeah. The bar yes. Oh, good. Okay. I was hoping so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, I listened to a lot of different recordings of people because when you live in the land of cover songs and you have to do a very iconic song, mm -hmm. there's just no way you're going to match or touch or you're just not going to be the same as the original. You know, like nobody is going to beat Barbara Streisand on that song. So for me, as a female artist, I look at iconic songs like that and I say, how can we change it enough to where it's not a, a similar, like sounds like, you know, that type of thing, mm -hmm. but how can we change this to where we can make it fresh, make it our own and, you know, just a different arrangement altogether. So I asked the producer, uh, Jack Jezro, I said, can we kind of swing people mm -hmm. <laughs> like can we can we make it a swing and he said yeah yeah that'd be kind of fun so i said well no one else 
in their recordings, you know, they all they all make it the same with these lush lots you know, of strings. strings, yeah. All the big strings. Right. And we do have we do have strings. That one is actually orchestrated, but but I I said, can we just kind of swing it? And they said, Yeah, sure. So I'm pretty happy with that arrangement. It's just a just different enough to where you go, oh, that doesn't sound like everybody else's. So hey, I'm very, very have, pleased. Have you with heard that one. from uh, Babs since uh, you <laughs> recorded that? <laughs> No. She hasn't called up. Hello. Hello, Jamie. <laughs> Hello. Why did you cover my song? No. Well, I think Steve Martin in his early days did people to a bluegrass background, oh. which was really oh, hilarious. That was, oh, that, that would be funny. Fabulous. Especially because he's such oh, an, he's an excellent bluegrass yes, uh, banjo player. I, I, exactly. Yeah, which reminds me, have you guys heard Ray Stevens' bluegrass version of Misty? No. No. Oh, okay. You have to listen to it. Okay. It is amazing. And the story is that his band, they were just kind of goofing off one day in the studio. They weren't recording. And they just said, you know what? Let's play Misty as a bluegrass. And (laughs) Ray was like, this is really good. Let's press record. And so it kind of started off as a joke. But guess what? He won the Grammy for Best Arrangement that year for that song. I'm going to have to look this up. That is amazing. I mean, you have to. So many yeah, great recordings to. happen that way. Yep. Yeah, totally. Jamie, this has been delightful. Thank you so much for talking with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for speaking with me. I appreciate <laughs> this too. You guys are so fun. So fun. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by June Goldfinger and Jeff Taylor, sponsors of Circle, Square, Triangle, a traveling exhibition on the architecture of Myron Goldfinger, and by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 22,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4.3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl, with guest research by archivist Kelly Policelli. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guile, George, and I'll be back soon with another groundbreaking edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Mm-hmm.